Well, welcome everyone. It's good to see such a full house today. Thank you all for coming. Um, I have a little confession. This is um, a topic I chose to challenge myself because I don't like math. <laughs> I don't understand math all the way. I don't, I just, I don't get it. Um, and my experience with math, I was, as you know, I was homeschooled and my parents, they used um, the Saxon math curriculum to teach me and, and my siblings. Um, and I found it dry and boring. And we just did sums and sums and sums and sums. And I got to Algebra Half, the book Algebra Half. And I did maybe 10 lessons, maybe. And one day I closed the book and I brought it to my mom and I said, I'm done. I will not do any more math. <laughs> and she didn't challenge me on that. She just, that was it. I never did another bit of math in my life. Um, so, yeah, so um, I don't have a lot of, I don't have a college education in math, let's put it that way. But then on the other hand, um, I ended up moving into finance. So I got a job as a, an investment firm and I got a, um, a wealth, wealth management designation and I got financial management designation and I was trading on the stock markets. And so I'm like, <laughs> I don't know how this works. So, so as I was studying up for this, because I told Adrian, I, I'm gonna, I have to, t I have to deal with math. We have, we've dealt with literature, we've dealt with books, we just haven't dealt with math. That's because I was avoiding it. So, tonight I will confront my fear. <laughs> um, um, okay. So what I what I discovered, and I, I kind of knew this would happen, um, is that uh, this is going to kind of be part two of how we define classical education. So if you were here for part one, we talked uh, primarily about the trivium, which is the three roads um, of language arts. It's the, it's the um, what we use to teach uh, reading and writing and spelling and everything to do with language. So if the trivium has to do with language, the quadrivium, it has to do with mathematics. Um, and so tonight we're going to talk a lot about the quadrivium. Um, I didn't actually see that coming. I'm not sure why, but here we go. Uh, so for, so we'll, we'll start with a, a quick overview of the quadrivium. What is it? Then I'm going to do it just a brief look at the, how the study of mathematics has developed into where we are today. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about like the wonder or the magic of math. Um, because we kind of lost that. And if we have time, we'll talk about a few curriculums. I, I, I spent a lot of time studying this and I did not actually get into like curriculum. I didn't spend a whole lot of time going, well, what math program should we use? So uh, I'm actually not going to solve your math problems tonight. <laughs> um, I know, right? <laughs> um, but hopefully we will, we will all be a little more excited about math. Um, so what's the use? Have you ever, if has your child ever said that? It's like, what's the point, mom? Why am I doing this? I'm never going to use this in my daily life. And then um, my, given my own experience, I didn't really do much algebra and I don't use it in daily life. And I have a hard time answering that question when my children ask it. Um, so we have to think about, I think it's good for us to think about that. It's like, is that the bar we're setting for ourselves? Like, how useful it is. And if it's not useful, then we should probably not study it. Is that what we're saying? Um, so that's where, when I started to look into mathematics as outlined in the quadrivium, or as the liberal, art, liberal arts alongside the trivium, I began to compare how we teach the two. So we teach the trivium and language in a certain way, and then we teach math in an entirely different way. What if we gave the quadrivium a chance, like we give the trivium? Because if we boil the trivium down, what if we were to boil the trivium down to being just useful, right? That would mean we would have to get rid of poetry. We would get rid of novels, no picture books. You could read the Bible and you could read the dictionary, encyclopedias, right? Um, pardon me? You could read some atlases. You could maybe read some like, manuals on like engineering or like mm -hmm. 
You could read that, right? Right? It would be horrible. So what is it that we so what is it that we do then? How do we so let's flip it around. If we teach our children then to read more than just the useful books to inspire their mathematic their um, imaginations mm -hmm. and their moral character, what is the mathematical equivalent to that? Now, as I said, I don't have a lot of answers. I just have a lot of questions. <laughs> okay, so help me out. Um, so maybe the problem is we've actually allowed ourselves to subscribe to that idea that math is merely useful. And we've been buying curriculums with all the problems in them and saying, there you go, there's math. But maybe it's not a textbook. We'll go into that a little bit more later. Um, the, the, um, the, one of my favorite books is, as I, I think I mention this almost every time, it's called The Liberal Arts, Arts Tradition. Uh, this one here, um, my dust jacket is missing. It's by Kevin Clark and Ravi Scott Jane, and I'm going to quote from it quite a bit this evening. Um, but one of the things they say is, the study of mathematics ought to strike a balance between wonder, work, wisdom, and worship. Right? Now, I would add that the study of math is actually also important to understanding the virtue of perseverance, and we'll get into that too. Um, and the perseverance is both for the teacher and the student. One of us, either me, the mom, or my kid is going to walk away with the better, more virtue, but. <laughs> um, okay, so the quadrivium. So if the quadrivium, as I said, is the three ways to teaching and understanding words and linguistics, the quadrivium then is four ways to teaching mathematics. And it completes the seven liberal arts. The trivium is the grammar, logic, and rhetoric. So the quadrivium then is first arithmetic, and then geometry and then astronomy, and then music. I've actually heard them define like this. Astronomy, no, sorry, arithmetic, it's the study of numbers. And geometry is the study of numbers in space, where music is the study of numbers in time. And astronomy is the study of numbers in space and time. Isn't that beautiful? That's absolutely beautiful. Or as my daughter was telling me, my daughter, she's in a, she's in, yes, she's in a math class. She loves math. And she was telling me her teacher says that math is, um, sorry, music is math in your ears and mm. art is math in your eyes. Right? See, we're getting a little of that magical wonder going. It. See, just a little. <laughs> math is so, oh my goodness. Math can be poetic, right? Um, I actually heard um, Professor John Patrick once. I was listening to a talk. He's, he's like a scientist, liberal art, like well, very well-educated man. And he said once, we don't yet understand quantum physics because we do not have a metaphor or we don't have poetry for it. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and I just, yeah. So let's take a look, a look at the four of these. And so if, if arithmetic then is just simply the study of numbers, <clears throat> it, then it's something that corresponds to the grammar stage of the trivium, right? So in the grammar stage, you're just learning the basics. And so with arithmetic, you're just learning numbers. Um, it's the foundation of mathematics. Um, and the thing about numbers, unlike letters, is that numbers are not just symbols of something, okay? A letter represents a sound, and that helps us to be able to communicate. But when I say the number five, what do you think of? five things or value, right? So so five is five, it's five things. I can't say five and you think of a bird. Yeah. It's just not gonna happen. Um, so numbers then are, are tied to reality. They help us to understand the real but abstract truth. So they're real, but they're abstract, right? Um, and they're particularly interesting in, in relation to spirituality and our understanding of God. Um, the most, when, when we talk about numbers in the abstract, the most obvious is, well, the Trinity right? We know God is three, but he is one. And so we're constantly dealing with, when we're talking with about the some aspects of the spiritual life, there's a lot of numbers in there. Or if we think about like the number seven, um, practically, concretely, it is seven things. But it can actually represent things like days of the week, right? Or it can represent uh, ideas of restfulness or fullness. If you look in the Bible, oftentimes God will use the number seven or 70 as a, um, for completion. So numbers kind of have so many different things that we can do to play with. And in the, in the arithmetic stage, we want to actually take time. We want to play with the numbers. Um, and we also want to take time to see where we can find out what numbers represent, not just 
what they are concretely and abstractly, but what do they represent? Um, and and uh, arithmetic, while it can take quite a bit of practice and perseverance to get, to get it right, um, we actually need to be spending quite a lot of time with arithmetic. Um, we should be focusing on learning the numbers, both in addition and subtraction, multiplication and division. Um, and we would actually spend most of the grammar years in some way, like a little bit even into the logic years with our children, um, focusing on arithmetic. And we'll talk a little bit more about the practicalities of all this later. Um, so then after arithmetic, uh, we, it talks about geometry as the next field of study, which is curious because does anyone know what we actually teach in schools nowadays after you've kind of completed grade six and you're moving on in your mathematical studies? What do they move into after? Algebra. algebra. Yeah. They move into algebra. Yeah. And then after algebra, they do geometry. geometry. Why is that wrong? Like, I mean... I shouldn't say, why is that wrong? It's the wrong way to ask the question. How is that, how is that kind of obstructing a child's learning process? They go together. They go together. So but anxiety. That's true. That's right. They go together. But what is it about geometry that we would want to teach before algebra? How much makes a whole? That. But when you're talking about how much makes a whole, what are we talking about? Is it abstract or concrete? concrete. It's concrete right? So uh, yeah. arithmetic, it's concrete. it's concrete, right? Arithmetic is concrete. So we've t taught these kids about n numbers and young children. Another thing is that young children can't think in the abstract, right? No. They can't. So you don't want to start saying you like this idea of mental math at age seven isn't, isn't really helpful. Um, unless un <laughs> I'm like, why aren't you guys getting this mental math yet? <laughs> no, it, they're not ready. Like they're seven, yeah, yeah. right? So, but, but to teach numbers in the concrete at age seven is really important. So if you show them, here's seven things and here's seven things, and you put these seven things on these seven things, now you have 14 things, they can see that, right? And at a certain point, they'll be able to do the mental math, but not yet because they can think abstractly, but because they're able to visualize it in their, in their minds, right? So we don't wanna do abstract with, with little kids. We don't want to. Now, we can do, maybe we can do a little bit of mental only if we've done the, shown them the concrete, okay? So this is why geometry should be the next field of study. Because geometry is concrete. We can, we can show the squares, we can show cubes, we can show all these different shapes. Um, but what geometry can do, though, is it actually moves us toward the abstract because there is such a thing as geometric algebra, right? So as we're moving a child toward geometric algebra, we're, telling, we're helping them to start to do abstract mental math. But if they have a good foundation in arithmetic, even the algebra they're doing, they're going to be able to picture these numbers or see these numbers. And it, it will move into, sorry, it will move into the abstract um, where, they're, where they don't even have to think anymore like of five things and five things equals 10 things. It's just going to be in there. But when we t show them geometry, move them from geometry into algebra, we're actually helping them along. Um, again, so the liberal arts tradition tells us this. Um, historically, Geometry provided the foundation for the very concept of proof in mathematics. And because its constructions make it a more concrete subject, it should be placed as the next subject in mathematics after elementary arithmetic. The most compelling reason for this is that <clears throat> geometry is still concrete and it can help the student move. I think I put that in there twice. It can help the student move from concrete to abstract. So Euclid, one of the first to write and teach geometry, um, he used geometry as well. Um, and so he's like one of the first texts and one of the texts that arguably, if you are, if you love math, if you are, if you love teaching, we, we should actually be using Euclid to start teaching math through grade seven. But he's somewhat hard to understand, somewhat difficult to teach. And so we don't, we've moved into um, other textbooks. Um, so, but one of the things that Euclid really focuses on as well is that, and the, and the key word in this quote is that, we need to help our students understand that the concept of proof of mathematics, right? So when they're moving into the abstract, it's not just now we're doing algebra and you can get me the answer and that's great. The answer is not the, the, answer is not the, the, the issue. We don't, we don't just merely want the answer. We want the proof of mathematics. We want them to work it out. We want them to prove it. Um, so geometry then, as we teach them to prove the equation, geometry can help them move it into concrete and then in 
uh, algebra will make it abstract. But proving proving the uh, work is actually is is one of the more difficult things, and I'll I'll go get to it later. Sorry, thinking too fast. Um, okay, then then astronomy. So the uh, the 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 third one is astronomy, um, and so as a liberal art, astronomy actually ties mathematics to the natural world. So this is where we start to see math and science intersect. Um, and actually, this is astronomy is actually anything but useful. I don't know. Have you found astronomy rather useful in your life? <laughs> um, like, what what is the point of studying the universe? And did they even put a man on the moon? Like, seriously. <laughs> Um, we'll, we'll, we'll go back to astronomy. <laughs> it's just useless. Um, okay. And then, and then music. So music is the last one. Now music actually has so much depth to it that I, I started and I got a little ways and I was like, huh, what? Um, so I think we're going to have to do a whole evening on music. Um, because as a liberal art, it's actually not just notes on a page. So they're not, when, when they're talking about music as a liberal, it's not like being able to be a conductor of an orchestra or play an instrument or sing. That is one aspect of it. But the important thing about music in the liberal arts is that music is harmony. And harmony is the resolution of all problems and contradictions. What is math if it isn't problems that are being resolved and brought into harmony, right? So th that's where, like, I, we're, I'm gonna have to spend some more time on that. But um, the, one of the things is where we see what we can see in music is that is music is where we can see that element of worship, mathematic as worship, because music will actually affect our souls, right? And when we when we have perfect harmony in our life, even when we are dealing with difficult circumstances or resolving mathematical problems or relational problems, which are mathematical. I could go there, but I'm not going to right now. Um, when we reach harmony, that's actually when we often end up in a place of worship, right? So, um, so yeah, so we'll, ha we'll have to, I'll, I'll think on that and we'll have to do something about music. Um, so that kind of is an overview of the four um, quadrivium very, very fast. Um, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of math. So um, the ancient Greeks um, they thought that everything on earth could be represented by a number. Uh, and they studied math for its beauty, not for its usefulness. Because at the time, they actually hadn't discovered how useful mathematics could be. Um, Pythagoras, did I say that right? Okay. Also, my, my daughter here, she like corrects me on this frequently. <laughs> so. Um, so Pythagoras, he was one of the first people that we would call a mathematician. And he just, he played with numbers. And he came up with what we now call the Py Pythagorean theorem. It's very useful. And Madeline has explained the whole thing to me, the, the, the whole, you know, triangles and how to find the, yes. Yeah, so it's, it's really important, right? I, I, I believe it. But did you know that the, <laughs> I, just, yeah, just, I just believe you. Uh, but did you know that the Pythagorean theorem is also very beautiful? Have you ever seen the Pythagorean theorem? Have you ever seen it? I want to show you this. This is the Pythagorean theorem. And this is my daughter's work, right? <clears throat> I just had to show this to you. And she explained, she explained it to me. So here we have the, the angles, the two angles, um, um, the right angle, of the um, triangle. So we know what these two are. And because we know these two, we can calculate that one. And we just can keep going like that. And just, it's just, it's absolutely a work of art. This is math in your eyes, right? Uh, um, okay, thank you, Maddie. Um, so as the medievals then picked up the quadrivium from the ancients, they tied it to their faith. And they began to apply mathematics to nature. And this is where we start to see um, a lot of strides in astronomy. So useless. Um, and they realized that math actually wasn't just fun and games and art. Um, they started to realize you could do something with math. So because they believed in a reasonable God and they believed there was a intelligent, an unintelligent creator of the world and the universe, they got very bold. And they started to apply these systems, they started to take mathematics, they put them into systems, and then they applied these systems on nature, and they applied it right out of this world into the universe. 
it was a bit of a conflict, interestingly enough, with the church because the two guys who found out, who started to talk about like um, ge uh, heliocentricity, the sun is the center of the universe, were actually in trouble because the church said, no, we can't believe that. We don't believe that. But these guys said, no, but if math is is concrete, if these numbers are what they say they are, if we have to believe this, and if God is reasonable and he says who he is, then, then this is true. Turns out they were right. Um, and 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 because of their discoveries, we have now we've continued. Well, we had we had this. It was like the precursor to the scientific revolution. So since then, we've had massive strides in in science. But the problem is that as we discovered the usefulness of mathematics post astronomy, um, we started to figure out that math could be actually quite useful, and so we started to create all these technologies and advancements. Um, and then we started to get into ideas like humanism, which is like, I think, therefore I am. And then we started to think we were pretty smart because we got computers and we started to build these wonderful things. And then just like the people at the Tower of Babel, we have started to say, look what we've done. We can, we've, we'll go, we've done, right? We did put a man on the moon. We're so awesome. And we've created cell phones and we've done all these wonderful things. And we've forgotten all about the wonder in the worship part of math, right? I think it's gone so far as now we've actually even disconnected math from reality. Because if I say to you today, if I say the, if I say five dollars, what does that mean? Well, but it, yeah, it's so if to you it means tap, right? And it's like, does it? Are you talking about like Canadian five dollars or like American five dollars or like we talk Australian five dollars? Like there's we actually, so we know what five means, but this mathematical idea of currency is like, it's, it's kind of rooted in who knows what. Uh, let's, uh, how about Bitcoin? <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so we don't actually see um, mathematics anymore as something that has to add up. Like, we don't even think that we have to have one man plus one woman equals one family. We just kind of go, I do this thing, I call it family. Right. So we've actually completely disconnected math from reality um, and and we've created a mess. Um, and I remember this from my, my days in the financial world, because um, it's the most like vivid example that I can think of. Um, when I was working in the markets in 2008, there was the major crashes. Right. It was like the banks were having trouble. It was like too big to fail. And one day we go into work and Lehman Brothers is gone. And the like the whole financial world these highly educated people are going what happened and then we started to hear about these things called um subprime mortgages and then we had these um these um these vehicles these financial vehicles and you just you buy this and we don't really know what's in it but just put your money on maybe you'll get it back or not and like even in the financial world those of us who were supposed to know what we were selling to our um clients we didn't know and we were told, it doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. Just maybe it'll make money, maybe it won't. Or, or even in our, in our training to be able to calculate the yield on a bond. It's really important. If you're going to be putting your money in a bond, you're going to want to know how much money you're going to make, right? So they said, here's a calculator. Punch in these buttons. That'll tell you what the yield for a bond is. And I'm, I was like, yeah, but how did we get there? How do we know what that is? And they're like, don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. That, that part doesn't matter. The people just want to know how much money they're going to make. So are we surprised that we've had like financial crises after financial crises? And then one more thing that just makes me laugh hysterically, uh, they call it the debt ceiling in the United States. Like, is there actually a ceiling? Like since when? <laughs> right? Right, so like, so there's like, there's no concept of numbers in reality. Um, so, so this is something to then as, as like as we're teaching our kids and as we're trying to understand how do we teach math, we need to actually start bringing math back into reality. There's two things that we can do. Um, one of the things is to start understanding math as the virtue of persistence. So while we're doing this, this arithmetic, we need to actually do a really good job of teaching arithmetic. And that means that when a child has to do a page of sums, and they're like, 
flopping around like they lost all their skeletal muscles, we have to say that I'm so sorry that that's happening to you. You actually have to try find your skeleton and we're going to sit down. We're going to do these sums. <laughs> we're going to um, because it takes hard work to do this stuff. Like it takes hard work to stick to a budget. It takes hard work to live within your means. And we've completely lost that. And that's one of the first places that we can start with teaching math. But it's not just in in, in finances, right? It's, it's in, um, we just have to learn to live within the lines of math. Like don't, um, um, we're, we're starting to see the curriculums turn into the new math where you can calculate it however you want. You don't need to follow this curriculum or that curriculum. And I'm, I'm suggesting that perhaps when it comes to math curriculum, we actually do have to be really picky now. We have to say, I'm sorry, I'm not doing common core math because you're, you're teaching our kids how to draw outside of the lines of math, outside of the lines of reality. Um, so, so I think, so those are kind of like the two things that we really need to bring back. The persistence as a virtue in mathematics and living within the lines of math. Um, so, but practically, so let's bring this now practically. Enough of my highfalutin stuff. Um, <clears throat> um, daily living with math. I actually don't have a ton of answers on this one because I've been thinking about it. And I, I think like when it comes to actually teaching our kids, the, the uh, arithmetic years aren't even that hard, right? It's like, go out for nature walks. Um, let them watch, there's a number blocks show on Netflix. I'm like, I love number blocks. Let them watch number blocks. Um, and do, there's lots of things you can do with actual numbers. But when it comes to kind of the high school years, um, is it even possible to teach a child mathematics without a good teacher? Like, for me, not liking math, I was just like, my daughter's in grade seven, you may now have another, you may have a math teacher, I refuse. Um, and I kind of asked that, like, looking for answers. Um, is it possible? Do you think it's possible that we could just say, well, no, I'm going to buy Saxon math algebra half and force my daughter to work through it? Should my mom have done that? Like, I don't, I'm glad she didn't. <laughs> um, so, but what are other ways that we could then look at, at interacting with math? Um, because I think it has to be way more than a textbook. Um, one of the things I do at home with my kids is uh, baking. I actually think baking is a, a really, really good way to teach math. Fractions, right? And it teaches mama's virtue. Like the virtue of patience. It's not scary because I think that we start our formative years if we don't have that firm foundation, afraid of math. Because yes. it's scary symbols and there's this cultural thing where so many of us are afraid of math. Yeah. And if we're afraid of it, our kids are afraid of it. Yeah. Whereas baking is approachable. So I, I'm glad you mentioned that. So, um, yeah, so what you're talking about is like culturally, we kind of been told like to be afraid of math because if you're. Because only the smart kids can do Right. Math. Exactly. Smart kids can do math and moms definitely can't teach math. Nope. We, well, that's how, why some people don't even want to homeschool. They're like, every time I, I said that, they're math. like, I can't do the math. And I right. was like, yeah. Right. I found that very interesting. Almost every single mom. So, so is that partly though, because we've turned math into a textbook? Well, okay. Right. Okay. There we go. I was the same thing. I was terrified of the reading part. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> Right. So, okay. So there's another way to turn it into a daily um, habit is you play games with it, right? There's, there's a lot of games you can play um, with math. And there's actually a, a number of different curriculums coming out that are play-based math. I'm just like, awesome. Let's, let's work with this. Um, but, but I think it's important to kind of circle back to that idea where we're told as parents that math is scary or maybe not even like or just generally because that that kind of hit me as well where I thought like I quit math and then I was like that's okay I'll just be a math dummy all my life I'll just try get by without knowing math mm -hmm. but the thing is like I can do numbers mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. right so from my perspective I, I had a similar story to yours <laughs> yeah um Math is scary because it's being taught in school in a big group of kids and the teacher and, and everyone learn at different pace. Right. So if you fall behind, mm -hmm. you're behind. Yes. And that's when the scary begins. And if you are not strong enough to say, I don't know, let's get back, you know, and your parents are not there to supervise, you're going to be falling behind until to the point that you are 
ashamed to admit how much you don't know, even when you get a tutor. Right, right. right. It's like, would I going to tell my tutor that I'm that much behind? Oh, yeah, I right. just didn't my head that I understand. Right. right? And you're still behind. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. when I start homeschooling, um, I was scared of teaching math. And now I'm absolutely fascinated. Right. And I, you know, like when I'm picking up different curriculums from different approaches, I'm like, oh my gosh, if I was taught math this way, I would have been right now, I don't know, like I would have been studying economy instead of psychology. Right, <laughs> right, 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 right. Okay, yeah, so that, and that's, so there we have a really good point there too, right? So as, um, as you're falling behind in math and it's true for like for me too it's like I'll just be I'll just be the math dummy I'm not gonna let anyone know I don't know anything about math whereas that's actually not the problem it's not that you don't know anything about math and that you can't learn about math it's just that you don't you're, you're at this point where you have come to an understanding of math and you just haven't moved forward yet and I love, also have only one understanding of math like that's for right example, until this day, I don't know the multiplication table. Right. But when I'm learning with my kids, the multiplication table in so many different ways, I'm like, I have no idea you can learn that. Much. Right. Like, this right. It's just unbelievable. Like, yes. I'm absolutely getting goosebumps and I'm super excited over it. Right. Right. And, you know? So maybe, so maybe the one of the things of homeschooling is like even to redeem our own educations and our own like math. Yeah, um, <laughs> right. Really yeah. So to, yeah. So, so, so as we as we turn as we take kind of take a look at this and we say like what is it about math that's just a like a for me it's a mental block or what is it about math that for a student like that they're just not progressing in math um, it's pr maybe because we're just we're not being we're, we're we're not helping them to find the wonder of it the wonder and the fascination of mathematics um, and that was certainly true for me because. Um, and I think, like, because my, my daughter now, I put her in a math class, and it's like, she's all she can talk about is math. Um, and, and and it's just been, it's been helpful for me to see, like, it's not about how smart you are. It has absolutely nothing to do with how smart you are. Um, it has it has to do with, are you, is it being taught to you in a way that is creative and where that clicks with your brain? Because arguably, I say this all the time about reading, because I, 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 I love teaching reading, I love everything about reading and you know and I'll often say parents will come in and they're like my eight-year-old isn't reading it and I, I don't know what to do and I'm just like why I'm sorry what, are you suggesting there's a problem like this isn't a problem right um it, just take your time try a new tactic and you know the child will be reading and maybe take a little longer this is just not a big deal but, but why can't we do that with math why do we feel like by grade seven, our child must be doing algebra? And if they're not, I have failed. The student has failed. They're, we're all just a big pile of dummies, and let's pretend that we don't know. <laughs> that, was, that was something that I was going to say, where it's like, we, why math is scary is because we have this schedule. You have to learn this yeah. in kindergarten, yes. this in grade one, this, and by grade seven, you should be doing this. But the problem is, is not everybody's going to learn it at that rate. And I have three very separate learners. And when it came to math, two of them were terrified of math. One of them was really just, it was natural. And the one that was, the older one who was terrified, it was just kind of like, mm, okay, where's the holes? Because I know for myself, mm -hmm. I didn't do well in math growing up. I actually failed it consistently until I graduated. Yeah. And then I went back to school as an adult and I did basically K through 12 math in six months and went, oh, this is easy. Actually, it's beautiful. Yeah. And so when I went back to my daughter, I was like, no, you can do this. Yeah. It's just that we have to go back to the foundation because if you miss anything in math, mm. it's like building a wall. You yeah. can't just leave yeah. out a few bricks. Yeah. It yeah. will yeah. fall apart. Yeah. You can't go back. You can't be like, oh, we'll patch that with paper. Yeah. And we'll patch this and you'll be fine when we get to algebra. You won't be. But then this is the problem that we're encountering in our society as well, where we've stopped doing proof the proof for, of mathematics yeah. right so you're suggesting like you're suggesting to your daughter you can understand algebra but in order for us to get there we have to follow these steps but the same thing is true within algebra itself if you have an algebraic formula that you have to sort out you have to work that out and show every single step of your your um of the process to the answer because if you mess mess up in one one part your answer is wrong yes. and no one is going to know Where what See the process i can't tell you where the problem is right because if your answer is wrong your method might be right you might have made a computational error in there and everything else is right mm -hmm. but you put a seven instead of a six yes now if i could totally geek out on you guys here for a bit um, <laughs> um the as i was kind of going through this the parallels between 
um, spirituality and math are also remarkable. So that this one, this idea of the proof, right? It's like, you've got to work it out. You've got to show your work. You've got to write it down. You've got to, that the verse that popped into my mind is the verse that says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, that's the same level of persistence and of, um, tenacity that we need to have when we're pursuing mathematical studies. Now, we all do need, we want to find the thing that's going to teach us and according to our, our ability. But even when we find that, there is a pursuit that we need to have to properly understand it or, or write out the, the proof of the equation to get to the answer. And like God tells us that kind of in our own life as well. He's like, in your own salvation. He's like, work, you, you each have to work it out, your own salvation. You need to pursue. Um, it's like, it's not once saved, always saved. It's not like, here's your, here's your problem. Here's your calculator. There's your answer. Done. It's not like that, right? Life isn't like that. Um, yeah, so I just I just find that that's where that's where I kind of keep circling back to the virtue of persistence in mathematics, right? Um, the, another thing is, I think you had a question. I was yeah. just going to say when um, we started homeschooling, my son was in grade five, and so we started in the grade five math, and I just saw he was really struggling, just so like very very slow, and it was just such a slog getting through it. And then I realized like you actually don't know your multiplication tables, and you're doing long division. Like you can't do long division without that base. Yeah. And just like you were saying, I, yeah. I told him it's like a Jenga tower with all the missing blocks on the bottom. It's going to be wobbly. Yeah. And so I'm like, we're going to pause. He's like, I'm going to fall behind. And I'm like, behind who? Yes. And there's no one else. <laughs> it's you, buddy. You're, it, you're in the front, yes. you're in the back, you're in the middle. Yes. Like, yes. <laughs> yes. And so we pause. Let's work out your own math problems. Exactly. And that was his. Yeah. And once we got it and he was confident and felt really good. He went back to his math and he flew through it. He yeah. actually mm -hmm. finished both of his math books before the school year. Yeah. And he was like, you were right. Like, oh. mom, yeah. it did work like that. And so it's, it's yeah. we have the freedom because we're homeschooling. Yes. Like, we're going to pause here. Yes. Or like, we're missing the beauty of math. Like, let's learn about, like, we're doing Pythagorean theorem. And I'm like, this is the worst thing ever. And now seeing this, I'm like, it's so beautiful. I want yes. to give this to my kids. Yes. Because I've been like, I hate this part of the math book. Let's skip it. Yes. Yes. So, so somehow, yeah. So somehow we have to, if, if, if math is boring, dry, if we're fighting with it, then we need to stop and figure out where we've lost the wonder, where the, where we've, we're missing the art, if you will. Um, yes. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just saying, like, don't be afraid to back it right up to blocks. Like, yes. Yeah. yeah. Because, like, there's so much you can just do with blocks. Like, yeah. Like, if you watch number blocks, like, I can't say enough about number blocks. Yes. Like, I know about number blocks, blocks thanks to Brittany. It's, it's incredible. Like, yeah. I've seen, like, four-year-olds doing, like, with massive three-digit multiplication. Mm -hmm. Number blocks is really big. Yeah. But you can just grab blocks and play with them. And Lego and fractions of Legos. Yeah. Like there's just so much in blocks. Like, if, like, if all they do is extraordinary grace, they will just understand it. Like, so, that's the concrete part of it. If that's you, right. That's the play part of learning, right? Or the learning part of learning. And, and that's how we discovered mathematics as a human race, right? The, that's the purpose of, of, like, I wanted to bring up the ancient Greeks. They understood mathematics as they understood it as a concept that was grounded in reality, right? But they only thought of it as something to play with. They played, they played with math constantly. And this is how we came up with the Pythagorean theorem. And we have like the Fibonacci circle and a lot of these, a lot of this stuff. But th that's because they were just, they were just playing with numbers. Now we've learned how to take that play and make it something concrete, make, turn it into something. Um, so if that's how humanity discovered math, wouldn't we want to like, in our families discover math with start, just starting with play, mm -hmm. uh, play and art, right? Um, um, Adrienne was telling me too today that one of her daughters, who's an artist, who actually did our um, the big piece of art in the entrance there, our, our sign on the wall, she loves math. But this makes sense to me because in order to be a creator, a, a, a really good artist will understand mathematics and symmetry, right? They'll understand the mathematics behind art. Um, this idea that you just you know, throw, we're not like Jackson Pollock, you just throw something on a canvas. And while that may have a, a, a beauty to it, that the beauty that's lasting forever is the, the beauty of an artist that has some mathematical 
consistency to it, right? Um, like look at the the Gothic cathedrals or the Sistine Chapel or all these things. These are these are mathematical wonders. Mm -hmm. The golden ratio. There you go, right? So so somehow we need to keep the wonder of math uh, in our lives and. Ultimately, we need to allow math to bring us to worship. Um, and this is where I can't, I can't even say enough how, as I was studying this, the, the parallels between um, mathematics and the Christian life just kept coming up, just, just kept coming up. I was even listening to a podcast on um, uh, relationships and uh, like just it, it's kind of like a therapy podcast like how we how different parts of us is talking about how who we are as human beings and he starts bringing up how relationships are mathematical and he's talking about uh, like a one-dimensional relationship isn't really a relationship because it's just me thinking you're in my way or you do this thing and I'm like why why are you there you can, can you move because I'm coming through right and this is like a one-dimensional relationship but you have like a two-dimensional relationship and you understand this person in this moment um, you can move it into geometry where you're saying okay you've got a person in this moment and they did this thing and I don't like what you did let's say you cut me off in traffic I don't like that you cut me off in traffic and I'm not going to have a one-dimensional relationship and just go oh you horrible person get out of my way but I could pause and I could say I wonder what she's going through. I wonder if she's maybe late. And so you think through the fact that you're a human being and you have things in your own life that may be influencing you. And so I don't take it personally because I see all these different dimensions to our existence next to each other, right? And he moves it right into physics. Um, a relationship is like physics where you consider a person's behavior towards you both in, in that moment, but that moment based on time before and after the moment right just like it just and he he moved it all the way into the fifth and sixth dimensions it's absolutely profound um and so <clears throat> I'm, I'm kind of coming to the end here i wanted to talk a little bit about curriculum um but we're kind of running out of time so i just i just wanted to end with an encouragement like if you haven't considered math as something that should be leading you to worship i just want to challenge you along with me because I'm super challenged by that. What would that look like in our homes? What would that look like with our kids? Instead of like fighting over math or being frustrated, what would it look like to say, okay, we're, we're going to stop this because we are not in a place of worship um, and, and just move, move from there. Um, and then just what finally about curriculum, does anyone have any curriculums on math that you wanted to talk about that you rave about or that you, because I didn't spend a lot of time on that, but I don't want to just kind of leave it. Yes, but Brittany. Well, I can talk to you about, yeah, I can talk to you about what I have. Singapore math. I'm not going to lie, I was like, no. Okay. <laughs> That's Singapore. <laughs> Sing yeah. So, so, so Singapore. Um, I did a whole YouTube on this on Singapore. <laughs> um, but quickly, so Singapore actually only goes up to grade six, and that's because they don't go into things like geometry, algebra, and physics. They don't, right? So, but Singapore gives an incredibly good basis in arithmetic in the fundamentals. Um, they have primary math. Don't look at it. Just leave it alone. Uh, if you're going to do Singapore math, you'd want to consider either their dimensions line or their primary 2022. I said don't consider math, but here, here we go. The primary 2022. None of the other ones. Just leave the other ones alone. Um, they are they are very good in drill, and um, they've got a lot of book work. In fact, they've had to. Part of the reason why they have so many different lines is because they've had to kind of like tone it down a little bit because the the other older lines are very good for schools when you have like a finite amount of time you have to fill and you just got to do it. If you're homeschooling and you want to tweak it, you don't want to use that program. Those older programs use the newer ones. So Singapore math, it's good on mental math. It's good on teaching concrete um, because that's why it's so colorful and it has pictures and things. I would still say you want to do, you want to use manipulatives even when you're teaching with Singapore math, any math program in the early stages. Um, we have some Saxon math down there. Now I am, we're going to discontinue Saxon math. I'm actually not a fan of Saxon math. I'm not, it's not because I didn't complete it. It's not because I did it when I was a child. <laughs> There's some stars there. <laughs> I had to go through therapy on this one. 
Yeah, yeah. So it's not that it isn't a good program. It is a fantastic program. It is the oldest kid in the block as far as math goes. Um, and it teaches in a very thorough way and has a lot of drill and all those very lovely things. But the two problems I have with it is one, it's soul sucking. <laughs> no, she said soul sucking. I didn't. <laughs> um, first, um, if it's not taught by a teacher, it is soul sucking. Okay. okay. I think that sex and math can be taught really well in a classroom setting or in a co-op setting or with a teacher who can really bring it alive, make it come alive and, and help. So I think in that case, yes. The other reason why I really dislike sex and math is because you will have to trade in your child for the math because it's very expensive. <laughs> and then like, what would be the point? True, but you would have the math and not the child. Okay. <laughs> so it, it's just, it's crazy expensive. I think like kindergarten is $200 and like we do not need to put $200 into kindergarten math. We just don't. <laughs> Netflix. Yes. Yes. Or like a box of Cheerios and like pretzels and have them, I don't know, you don't need to spend that kind of money. So, um, so that's why I'm like, it's, I'm not saying it's not a good program. It is a good program with qualifications and it's expensive. Um, the other program we just brought in, actually it's relatively new, is called Math with Confidence. And it's by Kate Snow. I, I happen to like Kate Snow. She originally wrote a, um, a, some books on, yes, multiplication, addition, subtraction, facts that stick, one book for each of the subjects. And they're all based on games. Yeah. And they're so fun. I wanted to get the level four, but it's not out yet till That's right. the next season. So we're actually doing grade three because I'm like, well, we could actually review all this stuff and you don't know all this like yes. you should. So we're doing it and it's like amazing. So you're doing the math with confidence. Yeah. yeah. Third, but actually got all of them because I'm like my youngest is going to be using it. Yeah. <laughs> and so and it's and you're you're liking it. Like it's working for you. Is it game based as well? Yeah, I mean um not every day is it a game. Yeah. But um it's like like they're always in there and they're they're different than the ones that are in the multiplication etc yeah so yeah really good. yeah but i like how um the you start with a activity lesson so you do a lesson with the child you do it with someone like together one-on-one -on -one, and then they have a practice page of what you've just learned and then there's review at the end so you're reviewing things that you've learned in the past right so it's always in your mind so you're not like oh i mastered that that's not in my mind anymore. Yeah. You're always reviewing things. Yeah. So that's a that's a spiral approach to learning. And spiral, oh, it does mastery and spiral. You have to get through that what you're learning that yeah. day. Yeah. So you do the mastery of the, the thing you're learning that day and then you do a review at the end. So, there's so three a spiral. Pages. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and lots of games. Yeah. And you play games like you play um rounding game, like you crash each other out, like you have to use cards, yes. and dice and um yeah. It's yeah. Just, it's okay. Fantastic. And it's and it's not super expensive. No. I actually bought it um, digital. Okay. So I print both the pages I need, and yeah. I just I just read the teacher's guide from my iPad. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, so you can get it digital as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and that that's like it's a really really new program. Um, I've like Kate Snow's math um that math facts that stick books have been out for a while. I've used them, um in in the co-op and with with the kids, but uh, the so this latest one, Math with Confidence, is relatively new. But I love Kate's approach to teaching math. Um, and from what I'm hearing from you, how it's being taught with kind of like a mastery and a spiral. There's yeah. games, there's drill work, there's teaching new concepts. So I, I really like that. I, I, I even bought the preschool one because my son's three. I'm like, oh, we'll start doing this. Yeah, content. yeah, yeah. And it, and it's just it's not expensive. Like you, so like you said, you can buy the digital form, but the, even the books themselves, I think they're like thirty dollars per grade. And like we can like yeah. maybe skip mm -hmm. breakfast to for that once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> This is not so bad. Um, Singapore math isn't actually exp that expensive as well either. So the workbooks and there's a workbook and a textbook that you need, and they are nineteen dollars each. So like you're looking at forty dollars a semester, which is again not bad. Um, now there's a few other ones. What else do we have down there? For the high school, we don't have much for high school math. Um, I do have like Harold Jacobs Elementary Geometry and Elementary Algebra, and those are really good i like i like those ones they would suggest that you start with algebra and then geometry i would say no start with geometry and then algebra um but and the, and one of the biggest reasons why we don't have a lot of high school math is because not a lot of parents teach their kids high school math not a lot of parents are going to teach algebra and calculus and as much as we love our children we're just we're just not going to relive the trauma um so um 
and and I, I would kind of agree with that. I would say when it comes to those high school levels, if you can find a teacher or a tutor, I do online classes with the Scola Academy. I have only good things to say about Scola Academy. The teachers are very engaging. They have classes three, three days a week, one hour each class. Um, and this teacher has been like bringing it alive. Like they do art in their math. They do, um, what else do you do? You do music. They do all the, and, and I, I, I heard the teacher recently, she doesn't know I heard this, but the teacher was like, she's very firm and she was giving the kids a, a lecture on how she's not seeing perseverance. And she is reading them scripture texts on like, that you you're called to do this like years this is what your task is and i i want to see you doing this like you guys aren't showing your proofs what is the point of this and it's just it's absolutely wonderful so like school academy is is what i really love but there are other online tutors too i just haven't looked into them all so that's kind of what we have downstairs yes i just want to say i have a set of friends who was a math teacher in public school and just going back to your point about, oh, you don't want to relive high school math, like, and going back to your point of, I can be good at math, and I can learn the math, this math teacher would just go to school early and learn everything she had to teach for the day. Wow. So it's not uncommon that even yeah. high school teachers that are yeah. teaching math don't actually, like, they're not right. professionalized yeah, in this. My yes. husband's a math, was a math teacher. teacher. Yes. He would have his teaching partner run in and quickly, quickly, can you explain this to me? I have a class waiting. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's like in the middle of a lesson. Wow. Can I tell that based on my daughter's experience of high school? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because she still does not get certain concepts. And I'm yeah. like, I don't understand how you're not getting. And shocking in high school right now, they're not even giving them textbooks. Yeah. So, like, I'm trying to help because I actually felt really confident in math. And there's no way to reference anything. I have no idea what she's being taught. Yeah. Well, it's all in my notes. I'm like, yeah, that does mean nothing right yeah. now. Yeah. There's no. She came to my house to, for help, and I'm like, okay, where's your text? I don't have one. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. So but, I have to go based on your notes. Yeah. And 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 uh, yeah. The, but the whole. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that the whole thing, like even the textbooks that they were using. So one of the the, the books that they're using in um, elementary school, like Jump Math, it, it's horrible and and it's it's confusing and frustrating children. And it's trying to teach multiple different ways of doing math. And this is and this is kind of a thing, a soapbox of mine. Correct me if I'm wrong, but our kids don't need to know five different ways to do a math problem. Mm -hmm. It one way will do using me and i feel very confident in teaching the kids math and yeah i was like wait what are they trying to explain here yeah and then i realized it was like they were doing it a totally different way of looking at it but yeah I'm like, but what was wrong with this like, yeah it was, yeah. yeah yeah we don't we don't actually need to reinvent math there's actually like the new math like mm -mm. i'm sorry i oh when she tells me that i'm like Okay. Yeah. So we don't need to we we don't need to conform with whatever it is we're being told the new math is. We can just we can just happily say no, thank you. Um, yes, Jessica. I just have a question. So, like we always talk about like multiplication tables, but as I'm thinking about addition, yes. Like, because in my mind, I kind of view addition like logically, like, you know, mm -hmm. like you're taking you're like rounding a number up so it makes more sense or whatever. But then also, like you said. One of your talks, and I won't quote you properly, but it was something like, if you take the memorization out of math, you're going to take the fun out of it later. Yeah. And I just wonder, like, I'm like, well, is it worth just memorizing, like, you know, 23 plus 8 or something? Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Or is addition and subtraction different than multiplication because it doesn't... I think it's different. Okay. Um, in reality, there's really only... The, the only numbers that our child ever has to learn is 0 through 9. That's it. That's all. And then beyond that, place value. Okay, so when it comes to addition, um, you really only need to teach a child to do addition from like zero to 20. And then beyond that, you just teach them how to, like when you're adding, if you have extra numbers, that that number goes into the next place value. And the way I explain it to my kids is it's like a cup of water. And when it fills up, it pours into the next bin. And when that fills up, it pours into the next bin. And so if you are adding it column by column and just pouring the number over into the next bin, you could be adding like, you could be adding 10 digit numbers and only ever be adding one to nine. Right. right? right. Yeah. Um, so as long as they're proficient in the, like that one to nine thing um, and then learning like doubles and, um, and triples, but then that kind of moves more into ma into multiplication, right? So, and even for multiplication, the reason why we only really memorize from like one times one to 12 times 12 is because 
well, that's all there is to know about multiplication. Beyond that, you, you can you can do it and you can figure it out from there, right? So we don't need to memorize like into the thousands. Um, and I think the same, absolutely same thing is true for um, ad addition and subtraction. Just learn place value. Well, I think the ten partners like zero plus ten, one plus nine. Yeah. If you know those ones, you yeah. pretty much know yeah. all of them. I think but, that's something addition facts that stick. Kind yes. Of too, right? So if you learn those things, then you. Yes. That's right. Yes. Yeah. It's like it's like anytime you have two digits, one of them belongs in a new place value. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. that's it. I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but also just kind of like you know like because I'm like you know say there's I'm trying to think of a question right now like five plus six for example in my mind I'm just like five plus five plus one like I just mm -hmm. break it apart and then I'm like eleven obviously I would know the answer yeah like, as an example. But, you know, <clears throat> you have, like, my daughter, like, counting on her fingers. And I'm just like, oh, you know, if you think about that, it's a five. Yeah. But I'm like, maybe she's just not there yet mentally. But she's also, so I don't know, like, when that clicks. Like, I don't remember when it clicked for me that it's just, like, change the numbers <clears throat> to make it work for you. Yeah. Like, if you're, yeah. You, you probably, like, until, like, I, I would let them have manipulatives until, like, eight, nine, ten, until they really feel like they can do it without um, manipulatives. Okay. Because they, because at, like, ages, what, how old is she? Seven, almost eight. Okay, um, at that age, they're 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 not capable of abstractly thinking of these numbers, right? So even if she's doing it in her head, she's still picturing five things plus five things, right? right? And so the the kind of rule of thumb in education all the time is always help as much as you can, right? Yeah. And so rather than saying no, I think it's time for you to figure out this without manipulatives, it's like why would you do that? Let her use manipulatives until she's ready to to drop the manipulatives and and she can picture it in her head and she'll know, right? She'll know when that is. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't take the manipulatives away for a long time. And and we even make it fun. We use like Cheerios, we use raisins, and then when they're finished, they're allowed to eat them. And if it's a really rough day, I'll even use jelly beans because like anything, <laughs> anything. <laughs> is 11 and she's very much been like a count on her fingers kind of kid throughout most of math and my philosophy was always as long as you're getting your answer I don't care how we got there this is working for you but now that she's done that she stopped doing it and she's starting to regroup in her head so I asked her a question the other day that was like what's eight plus seven and most of the kids know it's 15 because of crib. But um, <laughs> she went, well, 8 plus 2 is 10 and 10 plus 5 is 15. Yeah. And I went, oh, look at that. You can do this now. I didn't teach it to her. She's just naturally doing it because she's been doing it on her fingers. Now she's seeing it in her own yeah. head. And she's doing her regrouping just naturally. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And, 11, so. and it'll come. It'll So they first have to see it. Then they're going to imagine what they saw in their head and at a certain point it'll just come like they'll just know it's still these objects floating around in her little brain yes exactly but it's like reading right it's like when you teach a child to read they're sounding out every word and at a certain point they can stop sort of sounding and they kind of know the words but now when you and i read we just look at the page and we these words just kind of come out at us the same thing will happen with numbers so listening to you I'm like oh I did this but I didn't know I did this because she has manipulatives but some I think her brother had asked her what like eight plus three was in it or eight minus three she says I have no idea mm -hmm. and I looked at her and went, if you have eight jelly beans and I eat three of them how many do you have left she's like well five but why are you taking my jelly beans? yes exactly <laughs> exactly right yeah. immediately she's like well I can do that well and that's that's the thing I actually find that using food as manipulatives especially with boys yeah <laughs> yeah, like, we don't always use food, but like there's a Bo here in the back. See, see the nod here from Bo. Yes, you need use food, use food. Um, and depending on the day, um, and and the the need for persistence. Like if it's a day where I'm like, okay, we've been like you you you've slept well, you've eaten well, you've you've had all the things, and you can sit and you can do this math. So today you're gonna get Cheerios. Not honey nut, plain. Um, <laughs> right? So something like that, right? Whereas if it's been a rough, it's been rough. It's the end of the week. It's Friday and we just were slogging it like jelly beans mm -hmm. and marshmallows or something, right? So so work with work with with your child's emotions too. Work with where they're at. Um, the only there's only two more curriculums I wanted to bring up about what we have downstairs. One of them is rod and staff. 
I use Rod and Staff. I adore Rod and Staff. My children hate Rod and Staff. Um, but the thing about Rod and Staff is it's it's very numbers based. So it's like they do one plus one and then two plus two and they and one plus two and they just keep doing and they keep adding in the numbers and then they have the place values moving over um, and teaching them the place values and it teaches clocks. But it doesn't get into scientific math, which I like. Like we actually don't need to have a whole lesson on rulers and weather predictabilities and estimations and charts like we just don't need that in arithmetic arithmetic is like the study of numbers so rod and staff is very keen to do that um, i've seen my kids thrive through rod and staff um, it can be like pulling teeth one day and it can be just like my son did a lesson in five minutes the other day and the day before it was four hours so <laughs> It's a true story. Um, so I like I like Rod and Staff for the very good focus on arithmetic. The other program is the um, there's four four books by Charlotte Mason, simply Charlotte Mason. They're called the Charlotte Mason Arithmetic. And those are good too, th but those are like almost like teaching math in relationship. Like you want to you're 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 it's not a consumable text, so you're going to be working with your student to actually write the answers down on a piece of paper. But it's very much where you're going to be sitting with your child and it has activities and conversations and that sort of thing. So. I think those are the the ones that I would kind of recommend. Yes. I just have a question about changing the math curriculum. Like, Ooh. You know, sometimes, you know, like, Ooh. sometimes there's curriculum change. Okay, it's smooth because we're doing that for socials or geography or yeah. whatever. But for math, I feel like if you're slowly moving up with this certain text that you're using and changing it up, I don't know if anyone's had experience with that. If I'm feeling like I want to change it up with one of my kids if it's not quite working with them. Yeah. Is that... A, a bad thing to do because you might miss something and it's really okay the the truth about curriculum generally is each curriculum has its own language um in how it's going to teach the its own way of communicating the, the lesson so anytime you switch curriculums from one program to another the first thing you're going to have to learn is how is this math book going to communicate with me um, so that's one of the things that's kind of going to be against you but the but the way they teach the method may actually be better for your child Right, so some children will do well with Rod and Staff. I actually had to switch one of my kids over to Dimensions Math because she couldn't handle the black and white. It was far too stark for her. Um, she needed the pictures. Um, but on the other hand, my son has to do black and white because if I put the pictures in front of him, he will t he will he will end up in some fairy tale land, <laughs> and we, there will be no numbers in that land. Um, so. Uh, so it, it 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 does depend on the child. I wouldn't say I would say that you couldn't you can't just pick one program and say okay kids everyone you're going through this that might not work that way, um, and you may need to to switch programs. Um, I I'm always very hesitant to advise switching programs like unless you know you've tried it and the kid the child's just it's just not working for us. Then I would say yes you you should switch. But that that you want to you want to take some time and don't don't switch around. Lots of people just like, oh, math is, or the curriculum doesn't work when we're trying a new program. No, that doesn't work when we're trying a new program. Or that, and at a certain point, I'm like, I is it the curriculum, though? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, last year, I did have math with confidence for the first time with my daughter. Yep. For grade one. And this year, we started with math with confidence again, but it was kind of similar where she would end up doodling. And, yeah. And so we actually go back and forth based on the day. We do rod and staff practice um, practice in, drills. Yes, in the workbook. Yeah, and then learning new concepts. We'll go back to um, math with confidence, and we kind of just go day by day. Yeah, because she's different every day. <laughs> and see, and I love that because what you're doing is you're you're reading your child, right? You're trying to understand who she is as a person and what her needs are and how you can teach to that and like ultimately that's what we want to do right ultimately we want to be teaching our child not teaching a book because we have to right so yeah okay it is past eight o'clock um so with that i'm gonna say thank you so much for coming thank you for the discussion the lively discussion and the feedback i think this has been one of my favorites and i'm not scared of math anymore <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.